The more significant strand is the question about uh, trying to obtain a political solution uh, to the situation in Northern Ireland agreeable or acceptable to the parties. Now, throughout this period, conversations between the British government and the Irish government were constant. Indeed, by the, from the, certainly the late 80s onwards, the two governments invariably acted closely together. Didn't mean they were always actually in agreement, but they were very careful to try and manage their disagreements, uh, unlike the early 1970s, when, uh, early and mid-1970s, when there was very often public disagreement by, by the governments. With regard to paramilitaries, uh, channels of communication were open throughout this period. Uh, they were used in, in 1972, I'll come back to that, but the, the use in 1972 was, uh, I think, a real, was a fiasco and was acknowledged to be that after the event. Uh, and they weren't then used significantly until the hunger strikes, and there's a bit of controversy, mainly within Republicans, as to what actually happened then, uh, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, and then the channels from the 1990 onwards were used fairly constantly but informal inter-party talks actually only occurred in 1972, 1975, and from 1992 onwards. There's that big gap between 75 and 92, when there was no actual formal in in involve, in, you know, uh, engagement by the political parties in Northern Ireland with each other. The, there are differences between the various inter-party talks processes that occurred. Uh, in 1972, the British government essentially drove the process uh, and effectively compelled the unionists who were participating in those talks to accept uh, their proposals. The talks took place at Sunningdale, so the whole arrangement is known of it then since as being the Sunningdale Agreement. Uh, the result of this was that the, uh, the electorate, the unionist electorate, effectively rejected the proposals, uh, ending effectively the career of uh, Brian Faulkner, who was the then uh, unionist leader. Secretary of State at the time was Willie Whitelaw, uh, and Willie was a marvellous chap in terms of his comments and things. On, on a, uh, a documentary on Sunningdale many years afterwards, he, he was asked about this, and he said, yes, yes, indeed, uh, we did drive Brian Faulkner too far, but goodness, wasn't he foolish to allow himself to be driven? <laughs> it's a good way of blaming your victim for, 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 for what has happened. It's marvellous the way Willie managed to escape responsibility and blame for things that went wrong through things like that. But essentially, people realised that, those, uh, that the, the Sunningdale arrangement did not work uh, effectively. The, as I say, the, those arrangements were rejected by the unionist electorate. Uh, and the government was a bit slow at accepting that rejection, uh, which then led to uh, the... Uh, general political strike called by a group called the Ulster Workers' Council, uh, which I have to say, I, I, I'm a, as you may know, I sit in the Lords as a member of the Conservative Party, and I'm very happy to tell my Conservative colleagues from time to time that I'm proud of my role in helping to organise the only successful general political strike in British history. Usually it gives an eyebrow to flutter about a little bit, but there we are. Uh, after that, uh, the, the government did in the, the talks that took place in, in, 90, in 75, take a hands-off approach and leave it to the Northern Ireland parties to talk through a, a convention which they organised, an elected convention which they organised to see if they could come to an agreement. And remarkably, at that time, the Northern Ireland parties came extremely close to an agreement. Uh, uh, and an agreement which, in many respects, from, you know, in my view, uh, had, had that actually happened uh, had the help agreement been closed on in 1975, the history could be very, very different indeed. But it didn't happen. I'll come back later as to why it didn't happen. And thereafter, uh, the government tended to revert to the top-down mode of approaching it. They did organise the new Secretary of State in 1979. Humphrey Atkins did organise talks, but they weren't inter-party talks, there were his consultations with political parties individually to see if he could evolve proposals uh, they petered out after a while. Later, we had in 1985 the anglo irish Agreement, which again was a very much a top-down process. Uh, but it wasn't until 1992 that we saw a serious political process a beginning which actually gave space to the Northern Ireland parties and, in terms of the process of the talks, uh, made sure that it wasn't going to be simply a matter of government uh, dictating to those uh, political parties. Uh, this was epitomised by the procedural rules that we'd adopted in the talks for decision making. Uh, the procedural rules were uh, 
we, we, called sufficient consensus. Uh, we borrowed the concept from the South Africans who'd had a similar concept. Uh, we define sufficient consensus, obviously, in terms of our own circumstances, uh, as being a majority of unionists and a majority of nationalists. The question of majority is being determined by the electoral support for political parties at the elections held preceding the talks. Uh, and also the involvement of the British government on internal matters and on matters involving relations with the Republic of Ireland, the involvement of the British and Irish governments. Uh, and as effectively that gave uh, governments a, a veto, but it also gave a veto uh, to those political parties that commanded a majority of support within unionism and nationalism. But it meant that parties which didn't have uh, majority support within unionism and nationalism were involved but didn't have a veto. Uh, it was, you know, I think worth emphasizing this because this process meant that you couldn't have an outcome unless it was acceptable to local majorities in Northern Ireland. And this is surely right because if you're dealing with a process like this and you want your solution to last, it's only going to be durable if it is actually acceptable to the people who live there and have to operate it. And if the solutions you, you, you evolve are not acceptable to the local population, then they're not going to be accepted and they're not going to work. 92 was also the point at which the Republican movement signaled a desire to move towards politics and implicitly away from violence, although they were reluctant to be too explicit about that aspect of it. And the question arises, is why did the Republican movement in 1972, sorry, 1992, start to signal uh, a desire to move from violence into normal uh, politics. Now, in dealing with this, there were push factors uh, and pull factors. Push factors, uh, very much security force pressure. If you look at the security situation in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, as I said, thanks to intelligence successes, the authorities were foiling four out of five paramilitary operations. Uh, it's around 1991 that the IRA discover how deeply penetrated they are. And they were deeply penetrated. Uh, within the, the structure of the IRA, and that it had adopted a cell structure to try and uh, uh, to limit any uh, effect of penetration uh, and to limit the amount that any one operative knew, so if caught and interrogated and if he told, you know, uh, he, he, there was a limit to how much he could tell. But in terms of their structure, there was one unit that had access to the entire organization, and this was their internal security unit, which vetted every uh, recruit and also uh, vetted every operation that failed to see if there was any indication that it failed as a result of a leak. Uh, 